Hey everybody, welcome back uh, for the for the final uh, webinar today in our webinar series. Um, people are getting on. Watch that little box, and you know where your question box is because I'm pretty sure this isn't your first rodeo. Hello, John Stevenson. Hey, Ellen. Open those question box. I want to see. Hello, hey, how you doing? Cause I'm doing good. I'm doing good. But how are you doing? Let me know how you're doing. Make sure everybody can hear. Hi, David. This is wonderful. I just said, Bobby, great. All's well. Everybody's family's doing good. Yeah. Hi, Vernon. Doing well. Good, good, good to hear. Uh, I'm sure uh, this has been quite a week here with these webinars. Uh, just again, I cannot. Thank everybody enough for uh, your participation because if it wasn't for you, uh, we wouldn't be what they had the success. You you have made them successful. Uh, we've had really really good uh, speakers presenters today. We've got Greg Chumley with us. Um, see how? Okay, come on everybody, open that question box. You're gonna need them later. Ellen is from Wichita State University. Hi, Ron. Mike's on. Hola. Well, I'm going to they just keep coming on. Number keeps just going up and up and up. That's so good to hear. If uh, for some reason you haven't heard, I PMA uh, 2021 Educational Conferences in Des Moines, Iowa, just to the north. And uh, again, in the first webinar, I was talking about the uh, World Food Prize. It's a may. It's an amazing story behind that. Um, it's uh, hilarious, but I do encourage you to to uh, Google World Food Prize. You'd be very. Uh, it's just it's amazing what they've done and accomplished, and and the number of people um, because of this man that had this idea about wheat. Uh, it and. Uh, Countries around the world have benefited from it. Okay, so we're about a minute away. Well, thank you, Larry. Thank you so much. Uh, Bob Newborough says hi. And to you too, Greg. Not just me. I'm not hogging the whole show here. Oh, okay. Somebody. Uh, I think I'm going to be like. I'm going to go viral. I really do. I really think I'm going to go viral because I'm going to You can do it. You really can. All right. Just, it's just great seeing all these names pop up. I, all these people I haven't yeah. seen in a year. Tammy. Hey, Howie. I haven't seen Howie in a long time. Maybe use a different word than viral. Yeah, that's probably true, Bob. Uh, that that would have gone for forever, though. I think it was Howie's birthday just the other day. Was it Howie? Was it your birthday? Yes. Well, happy belated birthday to you. Ah, if you still hung over yesterday. <laughs> well, you're on your way to another year, so congratulations. Congratulations. All right. Well, it's two o'clock. I'm pretty sure people are going to keep coming on board, but uh, we're going to uh, introduce to you today Greg Chumley. Greg is the president of Print El El What is it? How do you pronounce it? Print Intelligent. Print Intelligent. Yes. You know what? I had that yesterday. I had that down. Uh, consulting. And he is bringing us the IPMA 2020 white paper, uh, Strategic Planning for Implants. And we're so excited. We're so happy to have you here. I'm going to switch this over really quick so we can see uh, Greg's presentation. Take it away. All right. Can you see that? Yep. Jennifer? All right. Perfect. Yep. Okay. Well, let's get going then. So good afternoon and welcome to the final session of this year's online IPMA conference. 
Over the next 40 minutes or so, I'm going to talk with you about something which could profoundly alter the way you manage your operation. I'm going to show you how to write a five-year strategic plan with minimal time and effort that is actually useful for running your implant. My name is Greg Chumley. I am president of Printelligence Consulting and have been working in this industry and writing strategic plans for nearly 40 years. Today, I'm going to start out by sharing some of the information I learned through research, my own experiences, and through talking with IPM, IPMA members about their strategic plans. I'll cover some of the most common barriers preventing implant managers from having strategic plans and how to overcome them. I'll show you what effective strategic plans look like and walk through their contents and structure. We'll talk about how to go about developing your own strategic plan and I'll share some ideas on how to use it. But first, let me shout out a big thank you to the organizations responsible for this webinar. Canon has supported IPMA in the industry for years through their generous conference participation and by sponsoring white papers like this. Bob Barbera, in particular, has been a great friend to the industry. I'd like to thank the IPMA management team and board for granting me the opportunity to develop IPMA's online self-assessment tool and to present this and previous white papers. Mike, Amy, Jan, and Jennifer are just awesome people. And speaking of awesome people, the IPMA members are great too. You guys participate in surveys, and in this case, several of you shared your strategic plans with me to help identify best practices. This association has a terrific community of highly professional members. Now, I presented at a general session at last year's conference in Louisville about the importance of strategic planning. Today, I'm going to show you how to write one, but let me set the stage with a slide or two. I used a racing metaphor at last year's conference and will use a football analogy today. There are three major categories you need to consider to build a winning football team. You need to have a place to practice and play. You need equipment, financial backing, and supplies. You better have star players. These people need to have the strength, endurance, skills, training, and drive to be winners. And if you only had that, you'd do pretty good at Saturday afternoon pickup games, but you'd crash and burn against an NFL team if you didn't have a playbook and a game plan on Sunday. These playbooks contain plays designed to leverage team strengths and minimize weaknesses. And every game has a game plan that is based upon things like the competition's strengths and weaknesses, momentum from recent wins, whatever is known about the other team's playbooks and strategies, the weather and field conditions, whether you're playing home or away, and so forth. This playbook and game strategy are not written and stashed in a file drawer. They're right there on the sidelines being used during the game. And if things aren't working and the team is down by 20 points at the half, the game plan is revised. That's what I'm talking about when I say strategic planning. You already focus on equipment, facilities, and funding. You already have highly skilled and experienced staff. But many of you don't have plans that you use on a regular basis. The result is that you play a pretty good game, but you could be much, much better. A few years back, I did a state of the industry white paper for IPMA. One of the sections focused on strategic plans, and I was surprised that roughly 60% of the implants surveyed had strategic plans. However, I found out that only half of those contained what I consider to be critical elements. Still, I was impressed that 30% of you have real strategic plans. So I reached out to that 30% and asked to see their strategic plans when I began this project. Well, Many of them admitted that they didn't really have a strategic plan, but several did respond, and here is what I got. Some said that their plans were all in their heads. They didn't actually have anything written down. Now, let me take a moment to clarify that I am not criticizing anyone. 
I may be critical of the plans I receive because they don't fit what I'm trying to develop, but they very well might meet the particular and immediate needs of these particular implant situations. A few people sent me short bulleted lists. Having a succinct list is fine. However, many of these bullets are pretty vague, such as identify and maintain KPIs and metrics. I'm sorry, but that sounds more like a value or a behavior than a manageable objective or initiative. I classified some as management exercises. Many larger corporations or government agencies require departments to submit paragraphs, bullets, or slides to roll up into an overall strategic plan. If your management wants you to drop a dozen bullet points into a standard template and call it a strategic plan, by all means, do so. These might help senior management ensure that everyone is pulling in the same direction, but they really won't help you much in your day-to-day -day operations. I see, received one or two magnificent examples I termed justifications. One was nearly 200 pages long, and it was beautifully designed. I imagine it looked spectacular when it was printed. These contained mission, vision, and value statements. They also described the implant's history, services, and equipment, and they contained cost analysis, competitive analysis, pricing, operating budgets, equipment proposals, and capital investment proposals. They were clearly written to showcase the implant's value and to justify acquisitions of new equipment. They were probably precisely what was needed, and I expect that they were very effective. However, they lacked many of the key elements I feel are needed for strategic plans that you would regularly use to run your business. I received some which I called reviews. These were pretty much lists of planned and accomplished initiatives. And I received a few which I considered to be strategic plans. They had mission statements, goals and objectives, and a list of initiatives to achieve them. However, all of these missed the mark. Again, they were all probably perfect for the situations in which they were used, but I wouldn't call any of them effective strategic plans. To me, plans need goals, objectives, and initiatives, and most of these documents were missing those elements and none of them contained targets or milestones. The justification ones discussed investments, but in a very operational sense for a very few large presses and not over the full five years. So why do people think that creating a strategic plan is so difficult? Well, I asked that question and the top responses were uncertainty, uncertainty due to organizational structures and frequently changing management decisions that are beyond an implant manager's control and that change even quicker than the organizations. A dear colleague of mine in Texas who suffers repeated management and funding changes basically said, Greg, why should I write a five-year plan? I don't think I could realistically write a five-week plan. My answer is that I feel your pain and your situation might be extreme, but no business has a crystal ball. And right now, every time there's a management change, people who don't understand document and mailing services sit down with a blank sheet of paper to decide what to do with you. Wouldn't it be better to start out with a plan written by someone who knows what they're doing? Sure, they might just toss it out, but perhaps, just perhaps, it might provide a starting point. I bet that most of you don't even know what an effective strategic plan looks like. If you don't, then how can you hope to start writing one for yourself? And sometimes the planning process never seems to end. Um, you have a lot of real work to do. And yes, you need plans, but you also need to spend more time using them rather than creating them. And of course, the most common complaint is that I've been running this operation for 20 years without a plan. I obviously don't need one. I think I addressed this earlier. Yes, you can successfully run an implant without a strategic plan, but think of where you might be if you actually had one. And this might be a good time to talk about the differing roles between strategic and operational plans. 
Operational plans are used to address how you're going to get your dirt work done this year. They are absolutely essential and are in no way replaced by strategic plans. Organizations without operational plans tend to flounder and fail, while those with strong operational plans are much more successful. But organizations don't tend to evolve much if they only have operational plans. That's fine in a stable environment where you can continue to do the same thing year after year, but that doesn't describe many of our situations today. Institutions and their needs are changing, and few implants can realistically expect to survive by only focusing on refining and improving what they're doing today. To put it another way, implants who don't have a vision of what they want to become in the future and a plan on how to evolve to become it will likely keep working hard and improving what they do while slowly going out of business. If you don't like the terms operational and strategic plans, call them life and evolutionary plans. Operational or life plans keep you from dying today. Strategic or evolutionary plans keep you from going extinct in the future. People told me that they didn't have the skill or knowledge to write one. Pardon me, but that's utter nonsense. Sure, you might have never written one before, but and you might have some questions and some information guests, but you know your business better than anyone. Any of you can certainly craft a usable strategic plan for your shop. And yeah, I get that you don't have any time. I can't fix that. But you might be surprised to learn that you can probably bang out a first draft of a strategic plan in an afternoon or two. This isn't an all consuming multi week offsite project. The reason people think that they are is that people seem to think that strategic plans need to be 50 or 100 pages long. The core of the best ones are usually only four to eight pages long. That's it. The rest is all fluff or supporting information. Let me show you what I mean. I'll start by what useful strategic plans should contain. They should always have a mission statement. Now, even though we're remote, I can still sense your eyes rolling. I also picture some sort of Dilbert cartoon every time I hear that phrase, but I'm serious. Rule number one with everything I'm sharing with you is that the goal of every step in the process is to create a document to help you run your operation. There is no need to get committees of agencies and lawyers involved to craft the perfect statement. Their result would probably be so sanitized and vague it would be useless anyway. Your mission statement is simply the description of what your implant does for your institution from your customer's perspective or institution's perspective. Simply write a sentence or two describing what you do. Just be sure that it describes the value and services you provide for your institution's departments in terms they would understand. Don't talk about G7 compliance or CAS certified mailings. What do you do to help educate students? sell insurance policies, cure cancer, or whatever your company, agency, or school does. Remember, this describes where you are today. If you decide that you are the vendor of choice for providing document design and production services, and yet 60% of your company's print work is sent outside, then you're failing your mission. Don't do that. Choose a mission that accurately reflects what you really do, not what you wish you did. Then run it by some of your biggest customers and your management to see if they agree. If not, go back and try again. This is possibly the most important part of your plan because it is your starting point. Everything you put in your plan is designed to move you from where you are right now. If you don't know where you are, you can't move forward. As an example, here is Alaska Airlines mission. Our objective is to be one of the most respected US airlines by our customers, employees, and shareholders. <clears throat> it goes on a bit longer, but listen to their tone. They are describing what they do in terms of their stakeholders will understand. They aren't talking about things like fleets of planes or maintenance levels. They are speaking their customers' language. The next thing you need to write is a positioning statement. Now, don't worry, you're already partway there. Just take your mission statement 
and tack on a sentence or two about who you support and why you, they choose you over the alternatives. You might need some time to polishing, polish your positioning statement, but if you can't clearly articulate what you do, who you support, and why they choose to do business with you over somebody else, then you're in deep trouble. Forget about writing a strategic plan until you fix this. Now, most of you know this answer. You just might not have ever written it down. Next, you need a vision statement. I know this sounds like another Dilbert cartoon, but bear with me. Your vision statement is critical. You cannot create a strategic plan without one. This is your target. One way to view a vision statement is that today's vision statement will become your mission statement in five years. How do you want to describe the role you want to play in your institution five years from now? This can be tricky, and some thought and discussion among your team and management and peer implants might help. And it might evolve over time. However, you want this to be as accurate as you can make it because everything, and I mean everything in your strategic plan will be designed to take you from where you are now, your mission, to where you want to be in five years. That mission of five years, which is what we're calling our vision. Take a look at Amazon's vision from back in 1995 when Jeff Bezos was sitting at a folding table surrounded by shipping boxes in a warehouse. Our vision is to be Earth's most customer-centric company, to build a place where people can come to find and discover anything they might want to buy online. Well, they certainly weren't at that level back in 1995, but that vision did become an accurate mission statement for them a few years later. I don't know what their current mission is with their diverse offerings like Amazon Web Services, but I'm sure they have one. Also, they no longer publicly share where they are aiming to be in five years. I imagine that's because they don't want their competitors to know and partly because they don't want to scare the children. I should mention that even if you stop here, you're already way ahead of the game. You can already clearly describe what you do for your institution today, along with who you support, why they select you, and you know where you want to be in five years. That's a great start. Now you need to figure out how to get there. One of the mistakes people make when writing strategic plans is to confuse goals, objectives, and initiatives. Not only does this make plans hard to understand, it makes them difficult to write. I'm going to explain the differences. Goals are broad, open-ended directional statements to support your mission and vision. These are the areas you need to work on in order to move where you are from where you are now to where you want to be. You might need to grow your business or increase market share or retain customers. In many ways, goals are like categories of objectives. Speaking of objectives, these are how you know whether you're achieving the related goal. Unlike goals, objectives need to be measured and have targets. You might have an objective to achieve 90% customer satisfaction or to increase revenue by 30% or to capture 80% of the print work currently being outsourced or to reduce waste to below 2%. Notice how all these objectives can be measured and, and they have targets. Goals are broad statements, objectives are specific. So when you're talking about objectives, you also hear the term KPI, which simply means key performance indicator. Basically, this is the way to measure your progress toward meeting an objective. It might come from an ordering, production, or MIS system. It might be a survey. It might be something else. But KPIs need to be repeatable and accurate ways to measure progress toward completing objectives. And while measuring progress is essential, you must also have targets to shoot at. And you can't just have a single goal at the end of your five-year plan. You need to provide annual targets. Think of my football game analogy. The coach doesn't wait until the final game uh, stats to make his decisions. He looks at passing yards, rushing yards, completions, interceptions, and of course, the score throughout the game. 
This allows him to adjust and adapt his plan before it is too late. You will want to know as early as possible whether you're on track to meet your ultimate five-year targets. The next elements that people often confuse with goals and objectives are initiatives. Initiatives are the major activities you'll need to do to achieve your objectives. Remember, this is a five-year plan. Don't get lost in the grass trying to list every open house event or training session for the next five years. These are the one or two major things you expect to do to achieve each objective. Unlike objectives, initiatives don't have targets, but they do have estimated investments and milestones. For example, you might have an initiative to launch a web portal in two years. Such an initiative might have milestones like platform selected, system implemented, portal launched. Again, these need to be specific but should be high level. This is a five-year plan, strategic plan, not a detailed implementation plan after all. Make sense? And finally, your strategic plan might have appendices of supporting information. Why do you think you can double your business in five years? Why do you think that a website will increase corporate utilization by that much? What are some of your customer satisfaction numbers? Some implants might not need any of this, while others will be dragged through it by their management teams. I'm confident that you'll know how deep to go and how much to include. The important thing is that all this goes at the back of after the actual plan. One of the justification style implants I received placed their six pages of goals and objectives starting on page 64. Again, that was appropriate for their specific need. However, I would put pages two through 63 in an appendix and move the goals and objectives up front for a strategic plan designed to be used in running an operation. And that's it. These are the elements that need to be in a strategic plan. Now, let's look at how to organize them. Strategic plans, not counting any supporting data and dependencies, are often four to eight pages long. That's it. Remember that these are working documents for you to use. You can, of course, make them pretty and probably should do so to showcase your shop's professionalism and design abilities. Also, you might want to present the content as PowerPoint slides rather than a Word document, but I'm just going to focus on the content. There are usually three key sections. First, is the executive summary for the big dogs who want to know what's going on but are too busy or too important to actually read much. Limit this to two to three pages containing a snapshot of your plan. I like to break this into subsections, starting with who you are. This is where you place your mission and positioning statements. You can also include a listing of your values if desired. A hint whether you should include them is does your institution or parent organization include values when they share their goals and objectives with you? You might also want to include a short write-up of your services, history, awards, and so forth, if you think your management doesn't know who you are. But keep it short. You can always add more details in the appendices. The next subsection covers where you are headed. This is where you place your vision statement. You might also want to include a short paragraph to more, more fully explain your vision. The next subsections are your institutions or parent organization's goals and how you support them. This is what makes your plan real to your managers. They will recognize these goals and they're gonna be interested in how what you do helps them achieve them. Without being too cynical, people always pay more attention when they are hearing what's in it for them. And finally, include your plan's overview with all the goals, objectives, initiatives, and initiatives, but none of the details. Notice how this section is organized to show how objectives support goals and initiatives support objectives. This careful separation of content types makes your plan easy to understand. And now, the meat of your strategic plan, your detailed plan. Here, you, flesh, you want to flesh out your, the overview you just showed with explanations, KPIs, annual targets, anticipated investments, and milestones. Let's take a look. 
I'm sure your designers could improve your plan's appearance, but look at the, co the contents and organizations. For each goal, I include the title and a short description. For example, provide professional and quality graphic communication products and services. Print related communications for customers, prospects, employees, and dealers is necessary for Acme's business success. Acme industry produces and uses a massive quantity of signage, direct mailings, brochures, notices, and other types of documents. These materials, quality and branding compliance must always support the quality of our company. This goal and the related objectives directly support corporate goals one and two to maintain market share and leadership and to deliver expected profitability to our shareholders. Notice that I explained how this goal helps my institution's objective, achieve my institution's objectives, and I even was able to link it to specific points in their plan. This makes it real to your managers. Then under each goal, I include the relevant objectives. Again, each one has a title and a short descriptive paragraph. For example, provide print-related services most needed by Acme Industries. Acme Industries have evolving print-related services needs. Document services constantly strive to advise, understand, and meet those needs in a professional manner. Document services will survey internal departments to identify their prioritized document services needs and work to meet them. Now, objectives also contain KPIs and targets. I place these in the table below each description. In this case, this same plan is going to survey their customers on potential services they would utilize. The team will compile and prioritize the results with the target to provide 12 of the top 20 requested services in five years. They currently provide seven of these services and don't expect to add a new one until 2022. Now, another comment here. You have set these measures and targets up. Well, you should be able to measure them today. What you put in for this year's number is not your target. It is what you, where you are right now. Again, we're moving from where we are to we where we want to be. The initiatives under this objective explain how they are going to achieve it. In this case, select and acquire a wide format press. Our departments are increasingly needed, leading large format printing for point of sale signage vehicle wraps, displays, and other applications. This is a high margin work, which represents significant potential corporate benefits if brought in-house. Their description includes why this is important, and their milestones indicate that they plan to evaluate it this year and purchase one in 2021. That ties back into the objective targets, which you see don't increase until after the new press is operational. Now, You'll also notice that they expect to add more services as time goes on, but they haven't listed any initiatives. That's okay. They don't know what they need to do yet, but at least they have a plan to identify and add new services at a certain rate over the next five years. After your detailed plan, you can place as little or as much supporting material as you need in appendices at the back. <clears throat> you might want to include a more detailed operational overview and data, which you probably cut and paste from your operational plan. You can include your SWOT and LACE diagrams, along with any research on industry trends, similar implants, competitive data, historical trends, and product pr proposals. How much you put in here depends upon how strenuously you'll need to defend your plan. Some shops might not have anything at all, while others will have lots. I'm confident you know which camp you fall into. <coughs> so. How do you create all this? Well, I recommend starting with what you know. Get a copy of the goals of your institution, parent organization, and even the major departments with whom you do or want to do business. These will help ensure that your mission, positioning, and vision statements align with what they are trying to accomplish. And those are the first three elements you should write. How could you hope to develop a plan if you don't know where you are now, what you are trying to accomplish, or where you are headed. Beyond that, there is no one right answer, other than it is an iterative process. Just be sure you end it. You will always have unanswered questions and new data. Stuff that new information into a folder for when you revise your plan next year and get on with implementing with the one you have once you feel it is pretty good. However, the next thing that I usually do 
is a SWOT analysis to understand your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Now, to be honest, most people stop at this point and struggle to use this information. It just gets stuffed in the back. To me, this is just the beginning. I take the, those strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and I filter out any of the observations which don't affect my path from my current mission to my vision. Remember, everything is moving me from where I am today to achieving that vision. For example, I might have strong duplicating capabilities. Yay! But I'm not going to spend time planning on how to leverage them if I don't see those services in my five-year vision. Then I prioritize the ones which remain and focus on the top five to ten in each category. Then I do what I call a LACE analysis. This is a process I created to use the SWOT results. I ask, how could we leverage each strength to drive us toward our vision? How could we address our weaknesses? How can we capture the opportunities? And how can we eliminate threats? By the time you're done with these two analyses, you're going to start seeing a lot of ideas which are starting to look a lot like initiatives, objectives, and goals. And there are lots of ways to proceed from here. One method is to translate some of these into objectives and identify how they would be measured. Don't worry about setting targets right now. If you have your objectives, group similar objectives together and into categories. And those name those categories like customer service, business growth, operational efficiency, et cetera. Now rewrite those category headings into goals like improve customer service. Next, take your list of current initiatives and any remaining ideas on your SWOT and LACE lists and add them as initiatives under relevant objectives. Don't worry about milestones and investment costs at this time. Just remember to keep your initiative strategic. I mean that in two ways. First, this plan is about evolving or growing your operation. Don't list all the day-to-day -day activities necessary to run your business. List planned activities for evolving your operation toward your vision. And second, these should be specific, but they need to be high level. Don't get lost in the minutia. The other comment I'd like to make about writing initiatives is to focus on the positive. Write them as though they will succeed. For example, you might know whether or not adding a weekend service makes sense, and that requires a six month study to get the answer. For now, Assume that it does and write your initiative as add weekend service with milestones like determine viability, hire additional staff, and whatever else you'd need to do to make it work. You can always remove initiatives later if your analysis doesn't indicate sufficient benefit, but that initiative is at least a best guess placeholder that will be replaced with something else you'll need to do to achieve the related objective. Now, Take a look at what you have. It's probably a mess. So you might want to rewrite your list of goals, objectives, organize it in initiatives. Once you clean it up, study it, and ask yourself whether each one really does help you attain your vision. If it doesn't, then you have two choices. Remove that objective or initiative, or revise your vision. Everything you, should, you do should be, should be moving you toward your vision. If it doesn't, then it's a distraction. I know it's harsh, but it's true. And at this point, you're far enough along to prioritize your list. In most cases, your plan shouldn't have dozens of objectives and initiatives. Developing such a plan would require a massive amount of time, and you probably couldn't implement it anyway. If you have lots of objectives and initiatives, then you're probably working at too low of a level. This is a five-year strategic plan. Try combining some of these together or filtering out the less important ones. Keep the ones you remove handy though. You did good work creating them and can probably use them later. Now, I don't know of any rule of how many goals, objectives, and initiatives should be in a plan. It depends upon the size of your operation and what you're trying to accomplish. However, I find that having three to five goals, each with one to three objectives with one to three initiatives, is a reasonable target. 
So as an example, you might winnow your list down to something like four goals, six objectives, and 12 initiatives. Sounds manageable, right? Well, now that you have a more manageable list, go back and try adding some targets, milestones, and likely investment costs. I'll warn you, you probably won't be able to do this for everything, but now you know what questions to ask. Go find what you need to know. Ask other IPMA members. Get trend data from Implant Impressions Magazine. Talk to your vendors. Ask your management about how they see your institution changing in size or scope over the next five years. Use what you learn to fill in the gaps and iterate your pro the process. By waiting to this point, you're not wasting your time working on things which you could throw out anyway. You might decide to eliminate or reword some objectives, or you might decide to add or remove an initiative or two. And you should be able to put in your annual, annual targets and milestones at this point. But be sure to stop. You could get stuck researching and tweaking your plan forever if you aren't careful. You need to focus on reaching a point where it's usable and then focus on using it. And let me pause for a moment to point out something you might have missed. This planning process delivers benefits for running your implant even before it is complete. As soon as you've written your mission, positioning, and vision statements, you can use that knowledge to make sound decisions. Just ask yourself whether that intriguing idea one of your people suggested helps you achieve your mission or move you toward your vision. If you're, already, <clears throat> you're already way ahead of where you were after only a couple hours of planning. After another afternoon of effort, you might not have targets, so your plan isn't complete, but you know what you need to be working on. Again, you can use this to manage your team and activities to ensure that you aren't just treading water, but that you are moving toward your vision. And after you start adding targets and milestones, you'll be able to manage making progress forward. So my point is that while you get, you'll get the most benefit out of a complete plan, it is a useful tool for running your shop even while it is under development. So what's next? Well, you need to validate your plan. Just because it sounds good to you doesn't mean that other people agree. Run it by your staff, your major customers, and of course, your management. Oh. And you don't have to wait until the end to do this. Engage any of these stakeholders, stakeholders earlier in the development process if you feel it is appropriate. However, it is essential to get your management to sign off on your plan once it is complete. Think of your strategic plan as a sort of contract. Here is how we can help our parent organization attain their goals. We can accomplish these things if we receive this kind of funding and support. If your management doesn't agree with the investments, then you're going to need to go back, scale back your plan, and possibly revise your vision. And strategic plans, like game plans, aren't meant to be written and filed. You should use them to make business decisions and annually review your process, progress toward your targets. You should have these reviews with your management, but I recommend doing it at a different time than your operational review. Those are painful enough without adding any more work to the mix. Revise your plans at these reviews and extend them one more year. This won't take nearly as much time as creating it the first time. It will keep them evergreen. Perhaps you missed or exceeded your targets or were forced to delay an investment or your institution experienced a significant business change. Adjust your plan's elements and targets accordingly to keep it real. Your plan provides no benefit if it is fantasy. And although I hate to bring it up, you will need some more plans. The good news is that these require less research and effort to create than your strategic plan. You see, your strategic plan is high level and covers five years with annual checkpoints to ensure that you are on track. <clears throat> you also need to manage achieving your objectives and initiatives for the coming year. I call these execution plans, and there are multiple types. If you want to grow your business, you'll need a sales or marketing plan. If you're adding a new service or solution, you'll need an implementation plan. If you're restructuring your team, you'll need some sort of hiring and training plan. This is not a big deal. You probably already do this. However, you need to link these plans with your strategic plan. 
every objective in your strategic plan needs to be linked to an ex execution plan to ensure that its KPI target is achieved. So you might link existing plans into your, into your strategic plan, but you'll likely need to create a couple of new ones with resources assigned to execute them. Just like a strategic plan, these execution plans need to have goals, objectives, with targets, and initiatives with milestones. And these plans have an annual scope with reviews at least quarterly and monthly. You don't want to suddenly realize that you aren't on track to meet your annual objective targets a month before your review. That would be like uh, a football coach figuring out that his passing game isn't working late in the fourth quarter when they're two touchdowns, two touchdowns behind. Neither one of you would have time to recover. The good news is that you can do this. You know your business better than anyone. As an IPMA member, you have access to all sorts of resources, including an incredibly experienced knowledge, and knowledgeable community of peer operations. And you can lean on vendors like Canon who have knowledge and a vested interest in having your operation succeed. As an IPMA member, you'll also receive the 28-page white paper I wrote containing this information and more details. In it, you'll find a discussion of different types of goals like directive goals, value goals, and operation goals, along with examples. There are hints for writing clear objectives, along with examples. There are examples and explanations of how to perform SWOT and LACE analyses. And there are tips for writing great strategic initiatives along with a wealth of other information. I encourage you to visit my website at www.printelligence.org for information about workflow automation solutions. And if you still aren't confident that you can do this on your own, you can hire me to help facilitate the process. And with that, I thank you for your interest and attention and uh, I'll turn it back to Jennifer to open it up for questions. Jennifer? Oh, everybody got their should already have their question boxes open. So, uh, but if you can't find it there on your uh, uh, go to women webinar um, box, uh, so, you can yeah. read read any of them to me, Jennifer. I my can't seem to stretch mine down and only shows one line at a time, which is okay. Uh, okay, uh, Mike. Actually, and, and I missed the message from Mike a while ago. He said uh, that your hair is getting long. <laughs> it is. But it, great job, Mike. Or uh, from Mike uh Lloyd, great job, Greg. And and you did. You did an amazing job. Um I just wanna as uh while while you guys uh take the time to get your questions, I wanna do uh just follow up a little bit on what uh Greg had said that uh yes, you will be uh receiving a all member organizations will be receiving a printed copy of the white paper. It will go out sometime after uh, Printing United in uh, October, uh, where Greg will also be presenting um, uh, the paper there, too. So I invite you right now that if you are planning on going to Atlanta at Printing United, uh, we will be having a, uh, a lunch and our breakfast. So uh, we're not sure what, but we, but like a good, you know, like the good Baptist do, we'll have food. So. Uh, if um, okay, from Bob Newbauer, what if you can't envision where you want to be in five years? Well, uh, I mean that's possible. I, you know, if you already are the vendor of choice, they don't send any work outside. Everything goes through your shop. Everybody's happy. Your management thinks you're wonderful. Then your your vision is to continue to be that vendor of choice. Continue to do these things. Uh, I don't know how many people are in that situation. Uh, so if you're happy where you are and don't see a need to change, then you you write what's called a, a value uh, um, vision, which says we are going to continue to continue to embrace these values. However, I suspect that most people aren't there. And if you can't picture where you're going to be, that's what you need to work at. That's where you uh, maybe have roundtables, or you talk to other IPMA members in similar areas and say, "What are you doing? You're succeeding. What do you, what do you, you know, what do you see changing? How do, how do I get to be like that?" That makes sense. Okay. I think so. Made sense to me. <laughs> but, 
<laughs> and that's kind of hard to do. So. It, it is. I didn't say this was really, really easy. I mean, there's these are difficult questions, but they're really worth asking. Okay. Um, also, I can say we'll wait, we'll wait a few more minutes to see if we have any questions. But uh, after this, I am like feel like I am on information overload right now. This week has been so wonderful. Uh, and I really, honestly, I really feel smarter. Um, so I'm sure I don't look smarter. So I thought about this now. See, Greg? Oh, the glasses do it. Yeah. Yes. Now, right, right, right. now, now I have that. I look smart. So, okay. From Doug uh, Larson, where do I find samples? Is there a library of strategic plans somewhere? You know, I, I was hoping that I would get some of that, but uh, um, two things. One is that, uh, um, you know, the strategic plans I, I, I received, I didn't receive a lot of them that I thought were really, really had, had all the elements. Each one had different parts of it. And the second is the problem with, with examples, library of strategic plans is they tend to be kind of personal, private information for the for the operation, which people don't like to or aren't allowed, frankly, aren't allowed to share. So I wish there was one. Uh, perhaps as we move forward, we can start we can start building one for IPMA members. That would be a great thing to do. Okay. Uh, got a comment. Well done, uh, Greg. And, and yes, a lot of information. Okay, from John Sarantakis. Today's world's events have changed most everything. Nobody could plan for this. Any tips on how to to stay plan focused during crisis? And that's a, to me, that's a really good question because not just for implants, but for everybody, because everybody's got a plan. Everybody had a plan for 2020. And right. Well, I think that I think the key is to view these as working documents, things that you use. If you view it as here's my five-year plan, I'm going to lock it away, and I'm not going to, not going to touch it for five years, you're in trouble. But if you look at this and say, like that coach that's you know 20 down at halftime, all right, I got to throw this away or parts of this away and re and and change it, rethink it. So if you treat this as an active document, something you use regularly to regularly to make your decisions, it's easier to go in and say, okay, I need to replan, I need to adjust, I need to make my adjustments. Uh, a lot easier than if you say, oh, I'm gonna have to throw this away and start all over again with the planning process. Now, can I say what the world's gonna be like coming out over the next 12 months or 18 months or coming out of this whole thing? I have no idea any more than I. I have kids who, I don't know what they're going to do about school, but they the school buses can't do social distancing, so they can't even get there. So the world is is changing. I don't think anybody has good answers for that, but the people who are trying and trying to keep a lookout are going to, and your businesses are going to, change, your parent organizations are going to change too. So this is the time to really be worrying about plans and saying how is this going to affect if you're a university, how is this going to affect how students get their their learning materials or how commu the school communicates with parents or whatever, because it's probably going to be a big change. So like just uh, as far as, well, any company, but especially I think, especially like the university and schools, uh, wait, waiting to see what's going to happen is not necessarily the best plan because it could happen like that. True. I mean, you do, you have to make the, I, I, I would say you have to make the best choices you can, the best, best plans you can, and realize that some of the times you're going to be wrong and you're going to need to, to uh, change or revamp with that. If I had an answer, I'd give it. I really would. <laughs> if I had an answer, I'd also be have a lot more money than I do. <laughs> That's true. You probably wouldn't be here today, but no. you know, uh, yeah, you guys, I'd be here, yeah, but oh yeah, oh that's true, that's true. From John Johnson, our organization has made a major investment into KPI, but left out why, uh, but left out why you were talking about for us to understand why why we are doing this. 
what do you mean they made a, I don't know what they mean by they made a major investment in KPI. Is it maybe training and how to do it or something or? I'm not sure. Uh, K, KPIs are KPIs are nothing nothing magical. They've been around for, I, I think the term came out like literally thousands of years ago. Um, they are it's simply saying you need to uh, be able to measure your progress. Their key process pr uh, performance indicators. How do you know you're winning? So if you if you have a goal and says I want to you know. Uh, I want to grow my business. That's great. There's no nothing with it. But I have an objective that says I'm going to bring in. Um, I'm going to bring. I'm going to keep 80% of the printing inside my institution. Well, you need a way to measure that. Do you go to pure procurement and find out the amount of money that's going outside? Is that is that it? And then you have the target. So it's something you can measure to say this ties to whether I'm achieving it. It's really related. Customer satisfaction is another one. So these KPIs are just ways to measure that you're making progress in the on the important aspects of getting there. They might well, be well, and he 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 did a follow up and said that KPIs are being used for budget only, not planning. Well, that so, doesn't make it's sense. It's John Johnson. Uh, I'm assuming this is the John Johnson in Palm Beach County, Florida, which in your backyard that's right so uh, uh i'm sure john that if you wanted to uh email um greg uh maybe get a little bit clearer conversation going his his email is right uh right there on the screen yep yeah i'd be i'd be happy to chat with you i mean kpis are can be used for anything i mean they can be used for budgets they can be used for implementations they can be used they're just the way you measure your progress basically or your performance okay well that uh, looks like that is the last one uh, I need to, all right well thank you jennifer you did a great job of of hosting and coordinating this whole thing oh thank you thank and i think you know thank you greg and i just want to reach out and thank uh all, all of our presenters, all of our attendees, everyone, it was, you You guys made this wonderful. I know Monday, it was the morning, it was like, exceeds living, exceeds women, and we're getting these boxes, and I'm like, oh my gosh, what is going on here? And, you know, we quickly, you know, made the adjustment, and so that that wouldn't happen anymore, and I apologize for anybody that didn't get in on the Monday. It is, it is available for viewing. Uh, we've just had, I've had a blast. I really have. This has been so yeah, much I, fun. Somehow I missed the, the virtual hospitality suite, though. Well, you know what? We were, I was just about ready to say that um, the uh, this is the last session. This is the last breakout session of the IPMA Conference 2020. And the night outing begins at 5 o'clock. You guys have a great day. Thank you so much. It's been so much fun. You guys are wonderful. Uh, we've got some more webinars coming up later, but I just, I need a nap. All I right, just love you all so much. Thank you, Greg. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.